Good evening, family. Welcome this evening to Bible Way Community Baptist Church, the place where Jesus Christ is still the Lord of all and the Word of God still transform lives. We're excited and delighted that you've tuned in this evening to be a part of our Wednesday night broadcast. We hope and pray that things have been going well for you and your family in your neck of the woods. And we do thank you so kindly for allowing me to come into your home, your workplace, your automobile, wherever you find yourself at this time. I just say thank you, thank you, thank you, because you could have been doing a lot of other things, but you have taken the time to study God's word. And, and God is going to bless you for that. God is going to bless you because there is a blessing, ladies and gentlemen, from st in studying the word of God. Matter of fact, Jesus says, man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceed out of the mouth of God. And I do want to take this time to extend to you that's out there in this viewership. If you're watching me, I want to extend to you an invitation to come and worship with us this Sunday morning at Bible Way Community Baptist Church. People are coming from all over the Metroplex. They're coming from Denton. They're coming from South Dallas, North Dallas, coming from all over. They're coming from Fort Worth. They're coming from Mesquite. They're coming, ladies and gentlemen, from Little Am. They're coming from all over the Metroplex. If you're within driving distance, I want to invite you to come on and worship the Lord with us this Sunday morning. 4215 North Greenview Drive, right here in the beautiful city of Irving, Texas. All right, well, we got a lot on the wagon tonight. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you and we do praise you for who you are, the God who here, and you still answer prayers. Speak to our hearts in a mighty way. Give me teaching grace. Give your people hearing grace and then give us all doing grace. And we'd be careful to praise you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. All right. We are studying again contemporary issues. We are, we are looking at what's happening in the world today. And we are trying to put a biblical perspective on it. So we're looking at contemporary issues. This is lesson number six. Lesson number six, how do Americans get in and out of debt? That's basically two questions. How do we as Americans, how do we get in debt? But then how do we get out of debt? And so that's what we want to talk about tonight. We want to talk about getting in and out of debt. One of the reasons people are so stressful today is because they're in debt. A lot of people, they're popping all kind of pills. They can't hardly sleep at night. I mean, marriages and stuff is falling apart. And uh, that's because a lot of them are in debt. Well, how do people get in debt? Well, what is this? What is this contraption here? Do you see this contraption? Do you see that hole there? What this is, this is a rat <laughs> motel. This is a rat motel. The rats, they check in, <laughs> but this thing, it zap them, and they don't check in. Out. In other words, this is a rat trap. That's what it is. It don't even look like a rat trap, do it? I know it. I know it. And ladies and gentlemen, it fools the rats. But that's how the same thing happened to the rat happens to us. We get involved in traps because they don't even look like a trap. Yeah, I'm talking about specifically money traps. Yeah, there are some money traps, just like this is a rat trap and rat didn't know that this was a trap. He thought it was free peanut butter, or free cheese up in here. 
<laughs> no, and he got zapped. He checked in, but he couldn't check out. That's because he didn't know that that was a trap. And I think this is why a lot of people are in debt today because they done got involved in some kind of money trap. Now, what I want to do tonight, I want to just ask some questions. I just want to ask some questions first. Uh, like, is college loan a money trap? Is college loans a money trap? Is keeping up with the Joneses a money trap? Is a get rich quick scheme? Is that a money trap? Is a lack of knowledge? Is that even a money trap? Are payday loans a money trap? You see all these payday loan places popping up and people look like they happy to give you a loan. But I'm wondering, is that really a money trap? Is welfare a money trap? Should we try to avoid debt? Some people say we ought to try to avoid debt. Uh, what does the Bible say about debt? And so you see, ladies and gentlemen, we got a lot on the wagon tonight. So. Let's go ahead and get started. Let's answer this first question. Let's talk about it at least. Is college loans, are those college loans a money trap? Should the president, you know, when he uh, became president, uh, President Joe Biden, he talked about that he was going to cancel and he tried to cancel the student loan. Should the president, though, try to cancel the student loan? Some folks say yes, some folks say no. What do you say? Well, just watch this. I don't understand how people overcome poverty in America. I really don't, you know? I've been working since I was 16 years old. I paid, helped pay my parents' mortgage when I was still in high school. I'm 32 years old now. I don't even have a mortgage. I don't have kids. I don't have anything to show for all this time that I paid into this system. I went to college. I have a bachelor's degree. My parents never graduated college. My parents didn't even graduate high school. I'm working on my second bachelor's degree, hoping that this one sticks. You know, like I was paying for nursing school half loan, half out of pocket, and COVID it. And now I'm looking at my last quarter of nursing school and I'm realizing I'm not going to be able to graduate. I'm literally out of money. And not because I failed classes or I did something wrong, I did everything right. It's just because I'm poor. I was born poor, I'm still poor, they want me to die poor. I don't know how you guys do it. <laughs> wow, I feel so sorry, ladies and gentlemen, for that lady. You think about it, she's 32 years old and she still got two college loans to take care of. She's, and she's still living with her mama and daddy. Like she said, I don't know how people do it. I don't know how people do it. She ain't even got no mortgage. She just got the college loans and got her car payment and stuff like that. And she's stressing out. She's stressing out. She said, I don't know how people do it. You know, uh, I, it's college costs so much today, ladies and gentlemen. I remember when I went to college. Now, that's many moons ago. Back here in 19, I believe it was 1981 when I first came out here to Dallas to go to college. And I. It cost me then, and college had just started going up, but it cost me then $1,400 a semester to pay for my college. And after, you know, eight semesters, uh, I was on, I think, around about $11,000. But it took us about 10 years <laughs> to pay that thing off, and we were stressing out, ladies and gentlemen, because, see, the thing was, back then, you, people weren't making that much money. And so I was making probably about $1,000, $1,200 a month, you know, $250 a week, sometimes $300 a week. But I had that $100 a month uh, payment in student loan. And you said, Ben, that, that ain't that much. It was a lot then. <laughs> well, particularly if that's all you got is $1,000, $100, ladies and gentlemen, that's, that cuts into the grocery bill. But you just think today, today these kids are having to pay $50,000, $60,000. Uh, 
And you think, if they get married, and both of them went to college, and uh, now both of them is in uh, debt, uh, they could be $100,000 in debt, ladies and gentlemen, uh, with both of them, uh, uh, $120,000 in debt. If she owes $60,000, he owes $60,000. Ladies and gentlemen, that's like a mortgage payment. So one of these kids can't get a house, even though they, you know, 32 years old, 35 years old, some 40 years old, and still can't get no house, ladies and gentlemen. And that's because they still trying to pay off these student loans. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of times people say, well, you know, you just need to go to one of these H HUB schools. I mean, H uh, historical black colleges. So HBCU school. But you know, I, I went to my, uh, I had to pay my, uh, my mom uh, car uh, insurance uh, down there in Mississippi. And I went in their office there and there in that office, ladies and gentlemen, there on the desk, the man had the four colleges. Uh, Ole Miss cost 51000 Mississippi State cost 50000 Southern Mississippi cost 49000 and Jackson State cost 48000 So, I mean, Jackson State, which is a historical black a college, it was right in the same ballpark as the rest of the white colleges and universities there in Mississippi. So, ladies and gentlemen, those loans could be a money trap, but you don't want to believe me, so just watch this. But one of the topics recently by Bernie Sanders was college is way too expensive for kids. We should have free tuition, at public colleges and universities. That should be a right of all Americans, regardless of the income of their families. Which I do agree with Bernie Sanders. However, there's one big question, and here's what it is. How do we fix it? So he proposed taxpayers pay for it, which do you really want to pay more taxes? Do you? You really want to pay for everybody's college education? See, my proposal is slightly different. Rather than having taxpayers pay for it, why don't we investigate and find out why does college cost so much in the first place? We did a little digging just to see where all this money is going to and what's really taking place, and you're going to be absolutely shell-shocked by the numbers. First of all, you pay taxes. I pay taxes. Businesses pay taxes. We may not like it, but we pay taxes. Who doesn't pay taxes? Well, you know who doesn't pay taxes? Colleges and universities. According to the IRS, the vast majority of private and public universities and colleges are tax-exempt entities as defined by Internal Revenue Code Section 501c3. Okay, no big deal. I get it. It's about education. Maybe this makes sense. We shouldn't be taxing them. So this means, obviously, their football ticket sales get taxed, right? Or on-campus concerts that have nothing to do with education. They also get taxed, right? Again from the IRS. Income and activities that are substantially related to the purpose of an institution's tax exemption, charitable contributions received, and investment income. Let me say it again. Investment income are not subject to federal income taxes. Are you kidding me? Can I sign up and start this business called a college or a university? But Pat, come on now. That's got to be only state schools because there's no way in the world that has to go same as private schools, right? Because private is like private enterprise, private businesses. They get taxed, right? Right? Like these Ivy League schools, they should be paying taxes, yes? Well, private schools get the same privileges as public schools under our current tax code. So not only do they not pay taxes on the land, on the tuition, or the sponsorships, or the donations, or the 12% they're raking in annually in capital gains from that bounty. <laughs> That's a lot of money. But those schools actually have the guts to get money from taxpayers on top of all of that. We're not talking a little bit of money. So billions in, zero out. Rutgers University has 70,000 students enrolled at an average of $26,000 a year. That covers room, board, parking, meal plans, and approximately $2,000 a year in books, which is a scam within a scam. So let's do some math here. Let's take this $26,000 of tuition, multiply times 70,000 students, it equals $1.8 billion on the low end. That's Fortune 500 gross annual revenue type of numbers we're talking about here. However, 
According to its own website, approximately 26% of Rutgers revenue comes from tuition with an additional 22% coming from state subsidies, also known as taxes. You know who pays for it? You pay for it. Having estimated the tuition revenue at $1.8 billion, we can assume that additional revenue they're getting is going to be around $1.5 billion from the citizens of the state of New Jersey. That's nearly $3.5 billion per year, ready, tax-free on top of that, tax-subsidized. By the way, $3.5 billion, the valuation of massive corporations like Yelp and Credit Karma, and as an annual revenue outpaces, ready for this one, the legendary Elon Musk's Tesla. Rutgers University is competing against Tesla every year, tax-free. You tell me if you don't smell a scam here. Let's take a look at what they do with this windfall of cash that they get. They must really give back to community, right? You ready? They hoard it. They organize non-stop donation drives and build these amorphous hedge funds called endowments. It's never enough. Let me give you a stat here. Harvard, a very reputable school, has an endowment of over $36 billion, which, fun fact, according to the IMF, would put Harvard between Bolivia and Bahrain as the 96th largest economy in the world. And based on data from the United Nations, there are over 100 countries with smaller economies than the Harvard Endowment alone. Listen, without even accounting for compound interest, their tax-free mountain of cash, just off that endowment alone, Harvard could afford to pay their $50,000 a year tuition for their 6,000 students. You know for how long? Not 10 years, not 30 years, not 50 years, 120 years for free and not asking for another penny. Meanwhile, student debt continues to pile up and has nearly doubled over the past decade, ready, to $1.3 trillion. If you took all our credit card debt, every single one of the credit cards we have in our pocket, you took all of it and combined it together, it's only $977 billion versus $1.3 trillion. One third of all student loan debt exceeds $100,000 and borrowers now leave school owing on average about $34,000. That's up 70% just the last decade. You may say, well, Pat, I didn't go to college. I don't have any debt. I don't care about any of this kind of stuff. How does this affect me? Listen, we are seeing now the student loan debt has had an adverse effect on other major parts of the economy. Between the high monthly payments and the mounting rate of default on student loans destroying young people's credit ratings, it's so much harder for them to buy cars, to buy a house, to move on simply because of the payments they need to be making. But the puppet masters know all of this. They're aware. They know exactly what's taking place. They know this is unsustainable. They know they are charging an arm and a leg and dragging out the process of four, five, ten years while all of this can be done in 18 months with a laptop and internet connection. Look, you don't have to agree with everything in this video, but consider this for a second here. 20 years ago, if I came to your place, you probably had photo albums everywhere, right? And I come and say, here's my kid, here's my mom, here's my family, all this. Oh, wow, this is so beautiful. When's the last time you had a photo album? We use Instagram today. Everything due to technology has become faster and more efficient, yet college takes longer and costs more. Why is that? Two reasons. Very simple. Greed and politics. College campuses have become havens for political favors and handouts. Look, let's take for example University of Virginia. It's the third ranked public university in America. Did you know this university has 19 members of the board who make the decisions for the school? 17 were appointed by the governor? 17 out of 19? So you may ask, well Pat, how many is faculty and students? Students get one member, <laughs> faculty gets one member. Two out of 19 they get, that's a monopoly in real life if you do it in business, but not when you do it in universities. Out of the 17 you appointed, five of them don't live in the state of Virginia. The 12 who do, 10 of them contributed to his political party. I want to go a little deeper because some people may ask, well, what, what else would be the motive? Who cares if I sit on a board? I mean, is there really money to be made? They don't get paid a salary, right? Can you imagine the amount of business that's on a college campus? Think about the bigger picture here. Who do you think gets the construction contract to build that new quarter of a billion dollar football stadium? Who do you think gets that? Whose cousin do you think happens to get the big Starbucks contract franchise approved to be on campus? 
or whose brother-in-law is charging prevailing wage to haul the massive amounts of garbage off campus five days a week? Look, I want to make one thing very clear. I'm not anti-education. I'm not anti-learning. I run a business for a living. I read books on a daily basis. I have a wife. I have kids. I have a family. I'm all for education. I was positively influenced by school teachers. I can tell you many educators that changed my life. I joined the Army because of a health and guidance teacher called Miss Sinclair that completely changed my life. We're friends till today. We write letters to each other. I don't have a problem with the educators. I don't have a problem with the educated. I have a problem with the educational system. And the educational system, when I sit down and uncover everything that they're doing, and I see the greed, and I see the politics, and I see the games being played, and I don't see innovation, while the world today is the most innovating times we've ever lived in, everything is getting better so much faster. But our educational system is not. And I'm not trying to tell you I have all the answers. Of course I don't have all the answers. I am simply proposing this to you for us to start thinking about it and auditing this and saying, listen, what can we do better? So I'm asking you. What are your thoughts about today's video? How would you see us being able to make the system better? I want to hear from you. Either comment below or tweet me directly at Patrick Bed David. I want to hear your thoughts. Wow, ladies and gentlemen. Now that man say that he believe that colleges is a big scam. College loans are a big scam. Did you see that? See, a lot of these schools like Harvard and stuff, them kids can go there free. You know, Bernie Sanders, who was running for president, said, hey, you know, let's just go ahead and make free tuition for all these uh, students. Yeah, because some of these schools got in their endowment. Did you see how much Ruck Rucker had and how much Harvard had, ladies and gentlemen? All those kids could go to school free, but that's just being greed on those schools' part. Shame on them. Shame, shame, shame. And so uh, uh, I'm going to let you decide, though, whether you think that is college loan and money trap. Well, what about number two? Is keeping up with the Joneses a money trap? Is keeping up with the Joneses a money trap? Many people say, People are keeping up with the Joneses is why a lot of folks is in debt. And a lot of people confuse needs with wants. And, uh, you know, we got the new poor today. The new poor, it used to be long ago, poor people just didn't have nothing. They was what they called dirt poor. They didn't even have no food in the house. They was dirt poor. Didn't have no clothes to wear. They was dirt poor. But today, the new poor has <laughs> got an iPhone, got clothes in the closet, food in the refrigerator, and they just don't want to eat that particular food. They got shoes, but they don't want those kind of shoes. They want some Jordan or something like that, but you don't want to believe me. So just watch this study looked at how spending habits have changed in the last century. In 1901, Americans spent most of their incomes on the necessities of life, nearly 40% of their budget on food, the rest on housing and utilities. Today, thanks to cheap mass production, almost half our income is discretionary. Only 13% of our budget goes to food, and almost half of that is spent in restaurants and fast food chains. But as our standard of living goes up, so does our debt. It seems we have an insatiable appetite for spending. And nobody's going to tell me I can't have what I want. I'll go ahead and buy it. John and Sophie are members of Debtors Anonymous. It's a self-help group based on the same 12-step program as Alcoholics Anonymous. We aren't identifying them because the group promises anonymity to its members. John. Wow, ladies and gentlemen. Now, you don't heard of Alcohol Anonymous and Drug Anonymous, but I, I have never heard of Shoppers. <laughs> I ain't never heard of that. That's my first time ever hearing this. Shoppers Anonymous. People got to go <laughs> uh, on a weekly basis or on a regular basis. They got to go somewhere and get some help because they're addicted. They're addicted to shopping. They're addicted to that credit card. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, 
I mean, I, I've never heard this before, so I'm glad we're studying this tonight. Uh, and because we're going to have to certainly pray for these Shoppers Anonymous. And we, matter of fact, we need to find some of these groups, Shoppers Anonymous groups, so we can send some folks to the Shoppers Anonymous. Because <laughs> I, I know that uh, 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 these folks ain't by themselves. They are not by themselves. And so it's keeping up with the Joneses, though, ladies and gentlemen. Is that a money trap? What about is a get rich quick scheme a money trap? A get rich quick scheme. You know, one of the get rich quick scheme is this, these pyramid kind of thing, you know, where people try to recruit you to, to come into their business. But they tell you, you can own your own business. You're going to own your own business and what have you. And uh, some of you don't even know what I'm talking about when I say a pyramid kind of uh, scheme. So just watch this. Recruited me to sell these cards, and now I am recruiting you. Who is this guy again? Don't worry about Phil. He drives a Corvette. He is doing just fine. Okay. Calling cards are the wave of the future. These things sell themselves. Who uses calling cards anyway? You know what? That's a nice attitude, Ryan. I'm just helping you invest in your future, my friend. This sounds like a get-rich-quick scheme. Yes. Thank you. You will get rich quick. We all will. Didn't you lose a lot of money on that other investment, the one from the email? You know what, Toby? When the son of the deposed king of Nigeria emails you directly asking for help, you help. His father ran the freaking country, okay? All right, so raise your hand if you want to get rich. All right. No, um, how is this not a pyramid scheme? All right, let me explain it again. <laughs> Phil has recruited me and another guy. Now we are getting three people each. The more people that get involved, the more people who are investing, the more money we're all gonna make. It's not a pyramid scheme. It is a, it's not even a scheme per se. It's... I have to go make a call. Wow. <laughs> Did you see that man was making that presentation and they caught on it. They, they figured out that basically you done bought us in here to make money for you. Yeah. See, that's the problem with that pyramid kind of thing. It presents itself as a multi level marketing scheme. Yeah. Uh, and multi level marketing is, you know, where uh, you sell goods, uh, product, and uh, everybody benefits. So the person at the bottom as well as the person at the top benefit. But in these pyramid kind of thing, they recruit you so that the people at the top can benefit, not necessarily the people at the bottom. That's why uh, uh, they have made these things illegal. Yes, a pyramid when you, if you go to a, uh, one of these business meetings and you find out it's a pyramid kind of thing, get out of there. Get out of there because uh, it's all about uh, recruiting you. They want to use you so that they can have more. So they, uh, they want to take from the poor and that the rich can get richer. So no, get on, get on out of there. And you got to even be careful. That's why you got to even be careful about certain churches that you go to, because some of these churches, the way that they uh, have a philosophy on money, it ain't no, nothing more than a pyramid <laughs> scheme, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, the preacher at the top, yeah, he, he driving nice cars and everything and looking good, smelling good, standing in big houses and what have you at the expense of his congregation, the poor. And uh, uh, when you go to these churches and they just focus, 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 focus on money, oh, I smell a rat. Yeah. I, I say, I smell a rat. Get out of there, because you know what that is. They're trying to trap you. Yeah, yeah. Not all, not all. So I ain't saying all churches, but I'm saying those churches that focus in on the money, uh, all that is, that's kind of almost like a, a pyramid kind of thing. Uh, 
Number four is a lack of knowledge, a money trap. Is a lack of knowledge, a money trap. You know, uh, a lot of our senior citizens today, ladies and gentlemen, they are being ripped off all because of a lack of knowledge. See, the world unchanged so much, ladies and gentlemen. We done moved from a cash-based system, and we're moving almost to a cashless society. And, man, they share them papers to you, and a lot of times you don't even know what you're signing. But you don't want to believe me, do you? Watch this. Another victim. Hi, I'm Dr. Marvin Smith of the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia. It seems that every week we hear heartbreaking stories of people who've lost their homes through foreclosure. Congress and federal regulators have worked over three decades to increase the availability of credit, particularly for mortgages in underserved communities. And they've also increased rules to protect consumers from unscrupulous lenders and brokers. But no amount of regulation can substitute for being an informed borrower to help you, your family, Friends and neighbors, we've created this video so that you can avoid the mistakes others have made. They all found out the hard way that when you borrow money, using your home as collateral, it can be very painful. Particularly if you don't really understand all the loan terms. You'll want to listen carefully to these stories. This is where it all began. The ceiling, having that done, and then these railings was included and this steel door. Veronica owned her home, but she needed some simple repairs that should have cost a few thousand dollars. What she got was debt close to $40,000. All I knew that it was getting harder and harder for me to take care of, I mean, to keep the bills up. I was calling different finance companies to see if I could get, you know, another loan. I had no idea of how bad things were really. It just built up from 15,000 uh, to 38,000, plus a balloon. Beware of balloon loans, which require a large final or balloon payment. In Veronica's case, she owed a balloon payment of $29,000 at the end of her loan when she would be 83 years old. Plus, if she couldn't pay it, she'd lose her home and refinancing or flipping her loan, taking out another loan to replace the first one, just put her deeper in debt. And then they put me in a homeowner's in insurance that I really didn't need because I, I didn't know they were doing this. What Veronica's really talking about is credit insurance. It's a policy often sold to subprime borrowers and financed in the loan. It's used to pay the debt if the borrower dies, becomes disabled or unemployed. Brokers often push these policies because they get big commissions. Also be aware that credit insurance primarily protects the lender, not you, the borrower. Wow, ladies and gentlemen. Now you're talking about the sad story. That's a sad story. And I feel so sorry for that person who signed that lady up like that, who handled that paperwork, who, who trapped her like that, got her in a money trap like that. Because on Judgment Day, God is going to get you. Yeah, God is going to get you on Judgment Day for messing with people like that. Because that lady was really taking advantage of And just think, she just had just a, a, a couple of repairs there in the house. Ended up getting a loan over 40 some thousand dollars and got a $29,000 balloon payment at the end. Who can pay $29,000 at one time? Shame on that person who put that woman there in a money trap. But you know, that's why the Bible tells us, my people perish for the lack of knowledge. Not only do we need the knowledge of God's word, but we need knowledge as it relates to businesses, as relate to uh, dealing with uh, mortgages and things like that and refinancing. So, uh, the question is, is a lack of knowledge a money trap? Also, are payday loans a money trap? Are payday loans a money trap? Some folks don't even know what I'm talking about when I say a payday loan, so watch this. 
Jennifer Williams, a Mississippi mother, was having trouble covering her expenses on a school teacher's salary. So she turned to a so-called payday lender. So I started with 200 and then when it was time for me to rewrite, I increased it to 400 and that was the start of my payday lender journey. That one loan turned into how many loans? At the end, I had a total of nine. Payday lenders provide customers like Williams with short-term, small-dollar loans. But unlike traditional banks, they don't require credit checks or consider whether a borrower can reasonably repay loans. The catch, shockingly high interest rates, often as much as 400%. It caused me so much stress, so many headaches, nights of crying, trying to figure out how I'm gonna get to the next pay period. So you called it quicksand. How would you characterize that cycle? I put it like a habit. You need it. That quicksand is trapping a lot of borrowers. One study found that 76% of payday loans are used to pay off previous ones a revolving door of debt with increasing interest. While lenders say they're providing a necessary service to help people with these small loans, many consumer advocates call the industry predatory. They are designed to be a debt trap. Lauren Saunders is the associate director of the National Consumer Law Center in Washington, D.C. How do these types of loans perpetuate a cycle of poverty? They perpetuate the harm we've seen in communities of color who have been deprived of income and assets. In Mississippi, where Williams lives, there are more payday lenders than McDonald's, Burger King's, and Starbucks combined, according to state estimates. And a new study concludes the industry overwhelmingly targets black and Latino communities in advertisements. Some states are taking steps to help. So wow, ladies and gentlemen. That's so sad. You know, those payday loan people, they just like predators. Yeah, they just like wolves. They are wolves. Just like a wolf is hunting down sheep. You got people out there that are just like wolves. They are hunting down poor people. <laughs> now, did you hear what the man said, that report said? They got more payday loan places in Mississippi than they do McDonald's and Starbucks combined and, and Burger King. Now, isn't that something? I would have never believed that. But that just goes to show you uh, uh, them wolves are out there. Mississippi is the poorest state in America, out of the 50 states, it's the poorest states. And all of these businesses done came there, these payday businesses, loan places done came there, uh, and, and they just taking advantage of these poor people. So are payday loans a money trap? What about is welfare? Is welfare a money trap? What about welfare? Is welfare a money trap? Some folks don't know what I'm really talking about. Well, matter of fact, some folks done got mad at me now because I'm talking about welfare. But we need to ask that question because we got some folks that's been on welfare two and three generation and then when this little baby come up, if that baby don't change their behavior, that baby gonna be on welfare, but you don't, want to believe me, do you? So watch this. Fathers have left home in order for their children to get meat and bread. There are so many dehumanizing elements in the welfare system that we are concerned about removing. Ultimately, we are concerned about a guaranteed annual income. And the other thing I think it is very necessary to say is that everybody's on welfare in this country. And when it comes to black people and poor people, we just call it something else. When it's for white people and rich, we call it subsidies. It's no secret, fatherless households are more common in the black community. A survey from the American Consensus Institution revealed that 67% of black children under 18 in the U.S. live in homes without fathers. This is a stark contrast to white children, as only 24% of them live in fatherless homes. But it wasn't always like that. The black families survived generations of open racism, widespread poverty, and slavery. They lived through segregation and violence, and strong family bonds used to be the norm. 
As of 1960, two-thirds of all black American children were living with both parents. That declined over the years until only one-third were living with both parents in 1995. So it's not the legacy of slavery, slavery that destroys the African-American it's the, it's family. The, it's, the, it's the legacy of the welfare state. Between 1890 and 1950, the marriage rate was much higher among black women than white women. A fraction of black children lived in homes without their fathers. But everything changed with the expansion of the welfare state. It divided the house and created a dependency on welfare. This kind of reminds me of what President Reagan said. I've always felt the nine most terrifying words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. So, what happened? What's the mechanism? Here is a detailed look at how the welfare state played a role in the dissolving of the family structure over the years. People say that the breakdown of traditional family units, family structures, is a byproduct of black poverty. Not just because there is no man to support the family financially, but also because women tend to earn less than men on average. Of course, the connection between the two is there, but it goes deeper than that. Welfare was a mean little business. It was designed to get people by in a pinch. Public assistance programs, like welfare entitlements, have been a part of American culture since the 1940s. Unfortunately, like in many other aspects of government institutions, black Americans were left out. In time, black people could also get financial support, but it wasn't easy. Mothers who applied for checks had to let social workers inspect their homes to see if their conditions were suitable for welfare. These workers also had to make sure no man was living in the house. But even if they qualified for support, the amount they received was meager and not enough to build a stable life. Wow, ladies and gentlemen. Did you see that, ladies and gentlemen? How the U.S. government is really destroying the black family. Black, <laughs> there used to be a husband and a wife in black homes, ladies and gentlemen, before welfare got started. Did you see that? How the welfare agent got to come in there and got to inspect the house, and if they see man clothes in there, then you can't get no welfare check. And so the man went out that welfare can come in. Welfare done destroyed, done separated the black family. Yeah. And see, you just about got to have two incomes, ladies and gentlemen. A real, real, real good job to make it. But what they did, they kicked the man out and then put, put us on welfare, and you don't get enough money to really to make it. You're just surviving when you're on welfare, and President Reagan was right. He says, I'm with the government, and I'm here to help. All to tell them, no thank you, we, we don't need your help. Anything the government is involved with, ladies and gentlemen, ooh, it's gonna take you years to get out of it. Yeah, it's gonna take you years. See, the government is involved in student loan. Yeah, the government is involved in student loan. The government is involved in FHA loans, 30-year uh, uh, loans. Now, you know 30 years is too long, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> you get a house at 30, you'll be 60 before you can pay it off if you just stay with that 30-year mortgage. You done used up half your life. <laughs> yeah, so uh, like President Reagan say, oh, uh, I'm with the government and I'm here to help. That's the worst thing that, that man can say. <laughs> oh, Lord have mercy. Because what we think is helping us ain't helping us, ladies and gentlemen. It's a money trap, do you hear me? There are money traps out there. Well, uh, should we try to avoid debt? Should we try to avoid debt? Uh, some folks say yes. Some folks say no. What do you say? Watch this. Borrow any money today? If you used your credit card, you did. You've heard it a million times. We are a nation of borrowers. The Fed reported today we increased our debt in March by more than 7%, the biggest increase in four months. While it's easy to get into debt, it can be a lot harder to get out. But there is help. Lend Richard Schlesinger an ear. Mary Hunt is in a peculiar position. The worse the economy does, the better she does on the lecture circuit. We get stuck in our lives because debt brings us down. 
Mary Hunt knows debt like few people do, and more importantly, she knows how to get out of it. You can start with a dollar, you can start with two dollars. For years, she was drowning in debt. She had a husband and two kids. She was a stay-at-home mom when she wasn't at the mall. A blouse here, some shoes there. For 12 years, she shopped till she dropped $100,000. When you were really piling up the debt shopping, what did that feel like to you? It was like, it was like this burst of energy and euphoria, a high like you can't imagine. The euphoria didn't last long, but it felt like her trouble was endless. It steals your joy, causes stress like you can't believe. It got to the point where she had to pay up. Bills had piled up, and she knew who to blame. It's not my husband's terrible job. It's not that we don't have enough money. It's not that we have bad luck, that we can't win the lottery. It's me. She got a full-time job plus several part-time ones. I ironed sh men's shirts in my home for a while, cleaning anything that I could do to raise money. The debt that took 12 years to pile up took 13 to pay off. When she finally got her bill down to $12,000, she launched a newsletter about how to stay out of debt, Cheapskate Monthly. How did the newsletter do? It did very well. Ironically, she now makes a living preaching what she practices. Mary Hunt teaches three easy ways to stay out of debt, two you'd expect. She says, live on 80% of your income and put 10% away in a bank. The third one is a little surprising. She says, give the remaining 10% to charity. It just kind of quiets that greed and says, you know what, yeah. I've got enough. Mary now has just one credit card and pays it off every month, and she's learned self-control. She didn't even mind being interviewed in a mall. Are you feeling uncomfortable right now? No, because as you see, I have no purse. She's making sure owing $100,000 will be a once-in-a-lifetime experience. Richard Schlesinger, CBS News, Newport Beach, California. Wow, ladies and gentlemen, that lady was $100,000. $100,000, do you hear me? She was $100,000 in debt. But notice what she did. She said, it wasn't none of my husband that done it. I done it. See, she was addicted to shopping. When she went shopping, she had to just shop. She had to come home with something. She couldn't just walk into a store and not come out with something. She had to buy herself something. But notice what she did. She took them uh, credit cards and she done some plastic surgery to them credit cards. But she uh, cut them all up and all she got now is one and she paid off at the end of the month so it won't get that interest and all of that. And notice what happened. That lady changed her lifestyle. She had to change her life to get out of that $100,000 debt. Yeah, and because she was a stay-at-home mom, remember? And the lady uh, started not only one job, she had two. Sometimes she said she had three jobs in order to get out of debt. And then the lady, when she finally got out of debt, uh, that lady wrote a book. She, <laughs> she wrote a book and then went out there in the world selling her book, telling everybody now, how to get out of debt and how to avoid, how to avoid debt. In her mind, she said, don't get in, because if you get in, it's going to be hard to get out. But what do the Bible say? What does, what does the Bible say about debt? The Bible says a lot about debt. Matter of fact, I would probably have to do another lesson, ladies and gentlemen, and may have to do two more lessons in order to really just cover everything. But tonight, I just want to just give you just, just a little bit to kind of help you uh, uh, understand what the Bible says about debt. Well, number one, God set a limit on debt. Six years in terms of term, it, it can, a debt can go longer than six years. Look what it, it says in Deuteronomy 15, verse 1 and 2. At the end of every seven year, thou shalt make a release. And this is the manner of the release. Every creditor that lends out unto his neighbor shall release it. 
He shall not exact it of his neighbor or his brother because it is called the Lord release. Yeah, God says in that seventh year, he says, release that person. Yeah, release them of that debt. See, God don't want us to have all this stress for 30 years, for 50 years. No, no, God says that's too long. Seven years at the max. Seven years. Matter of fact, when it comes to the seven year, then go on and release that person. That's the year. He says, that's the Lord release. I'm releasing him. Yeah. Now, that's Old Testament. I sure wish that we had that today, ladies and gentlemen. But uh, uh, even though man may not have it, that's something that you can practice that you say, hey, uh, I'm not going to sign a note that's going to take me longer than seven years. Yeah, yeah. And so we got to start thinking differently, ladies and gentlemen. Interest was forbidden among the Israelites. Look what the Bible says, uh, Leviticus chapter 25, verse number 30. 5 through 37, it says, if thy brother be waxen poor and fallen in decay with thee, then thou shalt relieve him. Yeah, though he be a stranger or a sojourner, that he may live with thee. Thou sh take thou no usury, that word usury basically means interest, of him or increase. But fear God that thy brother may live with thee. Thou shalt not give him thy money unto usury, nor lend him thy vehicles for increase. And so God says, no. In other words, God said, don't be uh, taking advantage of the poor person by uh, putting all this interest uh, on the money when you loan him some money. You got to treat him just like he's a brother. So interest was forbidden among Israelites. They had to look at each other like we are brothers and sisters in Christ. And we are. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. You wouldn't, you wouldn't be charging your mom or your sister or brother interest. He says, well, don't charge your uh, a Christian brother or sister interest. And then the other thing, co-signing was forbidden. It was forbidden. A lot of people get in debt because they don't co-sign. Proverbs chapter 6, verse number 1 through 5, it says, My son, if you have put up security for your neighbor, and I'm reading this out the NIV Bible, if you have struck hands in pledge for another, if you have been trapped, notice what that, he used the word trap by what you said, ensnared by the words of your mouth, then do this, my son, to free yourself since you have fallen into your neighbor's hand. Go and humble yourself. Press uh, your plea with your neighbor. Allow no sleep to your eyes, no slumber to your eyelids. Free yourself like a gazelle from the hand of a hunter, like a bird from the snare of a fowl. He said you got to free yourself from that trap. Uh, when you do a, a cosign, you just got in a money trap. And, 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 and God says, uh, uh, you, if you do something like they say, try your best to get out of it. Obedience to God brought financial freedom, though. Obedience to God brought financial freedom. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse number 13. It says, and the Lord shall make thee the head and not to tell, and thou shalt be above only, and thou shalt not be beneath. If thou hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day to observe and to do them. And so God says, if you just obey my word, God says, I'm going to make you the head and not the tail. You're going to be above and not beneath. And see, the head in other words, you're going to be in, in control. You're going to be in charge. And see, the thing that makes us all stressed out is when we are not in charge, when somebody else is controlling us and controlling our destiny. And see, disobedience to God 
it brought about financial bondage. Obedience brought financial freedom, but disobedience brought financial bondage. Look what the Bible says, Deuteronomy 28, uh, 43 through 44. It says, the stranger that is within thee shall get up above thee very high, and thou shalt come down very low. He shall lend to thee, and thou shalt not lend to him. He shall be the head and thou shall be the tail. So God says, when you don't obey my word, when you ain't going by this book here, he says, you're going to find yourself in financial bondage and somebody else is going to be basically controlling you because they're going to be the head and you're going to be the tail because you didn't go by this book. Proverbs 22 and 7 says, the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is servant to the lender. Mm. So the rich person got the upper hand. The borrower done put themselves in a servitude or a servant position. Now, the Bible condemned laziness. Some people can't get out of debt. They done got in debt, and they can't get out because of laziness. Not all. I'm just saying some people. Proverbs 26, verse 13 says, The slowful man says, There's a lion in the way. A lion is in the streets. <laughs> Now, think about it. This man said, I can't go to work, can't go to work because there's a lion out there in the street. Now, when the last time you done seen a lion in downtown Dallas out there in the street that's keeping you <laughs> from going to work? This man said, there's a lion out in the street. He didn't say a lion in the road. The lion is in the streets. In other words, he's in the city. And so there's a lion out there. There's something bad. And so he can't. He don't want to go to work because there's some bad. And we got a lot of people that sit in that home. They're couch potatoes. Lord help us. They're couch potatoes. They don't want to go to work because they're making all kind of excuses. It's bad. You know, it, it's, it's too hot. It's, it's, it's raining. It's, they're coming up with all kind of excuses. Well, they, they ain't no how to day anyway, you know. Just all kind of excuses. Just like that man, there's a lion out in the street. That's laziness. The Bible condemned covetousness and greed. Uh, Luke chapter 12, verse number 15 says, And he said unto thee, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consists not in the abundance of things which he possesses. See, some folks that just keep buying clothes, just keep buying, 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 because they're trying to be great. They're trying to be somebody and they, their identity is wrapped up in their possessions. And Jesus says, a man's life does not consist of the abundance of things. It ain't about things. Psalm 73, verse number two and three says, but as for me, my feet was almost gone. My step had very nigh slipped, for I was envious at the foolish man when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. See, that person was trying to keep up with the Joneses and they were upset with that uh, person because of the, uh, they was prospering and they wasn't prospering. And uh, somebody else was doing better than them. And so whenever you get your eyes off the Lord, that's going to sink you. Just like Peter, when he got his eyes off the Lord, when he was walking on the water, Peter sunk. So the Bible condemned covetousness and greed. The Bible teaches faithfulness rather than rushing to get rich. It teaches faithfulness. Just stay with it. Proverbs 28, verse number 20 and 22 says, A faithful man shall abound with blessings, but he that make it haste to be rich shall not be innocent. You're going to find yourself in trap, ladies and gentlemen. 
He that hasten to be rich has an evil eye and consider not that poverty shall come upon him. It ain't no work out. It ain't no work out trying to, to get rich real fast. God recognize and promote faithfulness. Exodus 23 verse number 30 says, by little and little, I will drive them out from before thee until thou be increased and inherit the land. See, God grows you just like God grew Israel. He said, I can't give you the promised land right now. Y'all ain't big enough to handle it. It ain't enough for y'all. He says, but little by little. And then as you increase, God says, then I'm going to increase the blessing. And that's how it is even with money and material things, ladies and gentlemen, as you grow more spiritually where you can handle more, then God will give you more. Yeah, yeah. Little by little. Yeah. The Bible teaches, though, apprenticeship. It teaches apprenticeship. Uh, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 13, verse number 55, is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And that's talking about Jesus. Luke chapter 3, verse 23, I'm going to put both of these scriptures together. And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being as was supposed the son of Joseph, who was the son of Heli. Now, the Bible records Jesus as being when he was 12 years old at the temple. But then we don't read about him no more until he's 30 years old here getting ready to start ministry at 30 when he was getting ready to be baptized by John. What was Jesus doing between the age of 12 and the age of 30? He was working in his daddy's carpenter shop. He was learning a trade. He was being an apprentice. Yeah, uh, back in Bible days. It wasn't even back in Bible days. All the way up to the 20th century, till we had the Industrial Revolution with factories. It was the responsibility of the father to teach his children a trade. It was a responsibility of a mother to, uh, to teach their daughter a trade, yeah. And uh, if you didn't wanna, uh, let's say if your daddy was a farmer and you didn't wanna be a, a farmer, but the, the neighbor, he was a carpenter, well then you could go over to your neighbor and ask your neighbor, hey, can you train me how to be a carpenter? I wanna be a carpenter. And you was an apprentice. A lot of time apprentice program, some of them was 10 years, some was seven years. It all depends on, on, on what you worked out. Uh, but uh, apprenticeship, apprenticeship. So you didn't have to go and, and spend $50,000 to try to uh, uh, be a carpenter, uh, to be a plumber, uh, to, to uh, get a, a trade. No, there was somebody, your, either your dad or your mama or somebody in the community would teach you a trade for free. Basically, all you had to do, you were just basically working for them, for the most part, for free. You know, they would put you up, you know, food, clothing, and shelter and stuff like that, for, particularly if you had to, you know, leave town on an apprenticeship. But uh, uh, that's what the Bible uh, teaches. It teaches apprenticeship. The Bible teaches to put God first. Uh, in Malachi chapter 3, Verse number 10, it says, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in my house and prove me now wherein said the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out for you blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And then Matthew chapter six, verse number 33, it says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and these other things shall be added unto thee. Now, what other things? Food, clothing, shelter, whatever you need. God said, if you seek me first, he said, I got you covered. I'll make sure that you, your needs are taken care of. Well, how should we apply this lesson? Number one, become a good steward. Become a good steward. See, the way to get out of debt, you just have to uh, cut expenses 
and then increase income. That, that's the only way you're going to be able to get out. You got to cut expenses and then increase your income. Then number two, become a tither. Become a tither. Put God first. I know some of you out there say, you know, God is, is the head of my life. God is the Lord of my life. Uh, I, I love the Lord. Well, show that by paying your tithes. Show that by become a tither. Take 10%, the first tenth, and it ain't just a 10%, it's the first tenth. Yeah, the first tenth. Take it, take it off the top there and give that to God. Develop and live off of a budget. Yeah, develop and live off of a budget. What a budget is, it's just a financial plan. It's a financial plan showing uh, of where you're going to uh, uh, put your money, where you're going to spend your money, and how you're going to spend your money. So develop and live off that budget. Just don't write it out. Live off that budget. And then pay off your consumer debt. Pay off your debt. Go on and pay off your car. Go on and pay off your credit cards. Go on and pay off your other lit bills and what have you. Pay off because that's what's stressing you out. That credit card, those three or four credit cards. Pay one off at a time. You pay, you pay that visa off, then when you finish paying the visa off, pay the MasterCard off. When you finish paying that MasterCard off, then pay the Discover card off and, and, and just snowball it. So the money that you had with that visa, then just go ahead and, and put that money as well as the, the money you had already for the MasterCard. Pay that off. And then once you done paid off that MasterCard and that visa, the money that you was using to pay the MasterCard and the visa, now go on and, and, and double up and pay that discover card. So take them one at a time, take them one at a time, little by little, you're going to pay it all off. Then give God 10%, save 10%, and if you can, and if you can, and I believe you can, invest another 10%. Yeah. So, and then live off 70%. Yeah. Now I know that's hard. But that, that means that's a lifestyle change. You, you won't be able to, you know, go to McDonald's, you know, every week. Uh, you won't be able to go to Chili's, uh, Applebee's all the time. Whenever somebody say, hey, y'all want to go to Applebee's? Tell them, no, I can't go to Applebee's. I'm trying to pay off Applebee's. <laughs> uh, and then train your children on biblical finances. Yeah. See, one of the reasons most of us is in debt, our parents, they didn't teach us about biblical finances. They didn't teach us. See, these Koreans and these uh, uh, Asian people, man, when they sitting around the dinner table at night, they already talking about uh, what they're going to do with the money and, and their businesses and stuff like that. You know, while we're talking about good times and, and, and watching television and football games and baseball games, basketball games, they ain't into that. They into how they can start a donut shop, <laughs> uh, how they can start a chicken and rice place, you know, what have you. And so uh, train your children on biblical finances and then teach others on biblical finance. Share what you done, that knowledge that you got, sh share it with somebody else because our people are indeed perishing for lack of knowledge. Well, that's our lesson for tonight. Thank you so kindly for joining us. Let us pray. Father, we do thank you for this lesson. Now, Lord, take this lesson and use it to bring honor and glory to your name. Lord, I pray that you will uh, help us to apply this lesson, Lord. Lord, I pray that you will uh, strengthen your people, um, particularly those that are all stretched out. Help them, dear God, to bring their burdens to you, O oh Lord, and to just leave it right there. Knowing, dear God, that you're going to meet every one of our needs according to your riches in glory. So, Lord, we thank you even in advance. Now, Lord, if somebody is in need of a healing, would you be so kind and touch their bodies and heal their bodies? For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, that's it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you again for joining us. Now listen, stay encouraged. I say stay encouraged and have a good night. And Lord willing, we're going to see you 
on Sunday.